So, anyhow, but today, yeah, 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 all right, chat's doing good, chat's doing vibing. Today, we are going to be continuing our conquest of the wonderful game of kings, the wonderful game of chess, and we are going to be talking about burps. I'm just kidding, not burps, I just burped, I just had lunch. So, today we are going to be doing a little bit of a refresher from last time. So, last time we just learned how the pieces move and all that good stuff. We're going to learn, we're going to review piece values, because each piece has a certain value assigned to it based on how important it is and how much it can do. And we'll talk a little a bit about capturing and how captures work and trades work and whether it's you can evaluate if it's a good trade, a bad trade, or kind of a eh trade. And then from there, I'm also going to teach you guys a fancy little French move that pawns can do at the very, very end. So we'll give you guys a little teaser there as well. So, Chili. And by the way, Drew, just before we get started, uh, if you could share your screen with me so that there's no... Oh, yeah, yes, 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 yes. Production value. You can tell that we coordinated so well before lesson. Here we <laughs> go. So cool. Yeah. Um. So here we are. And chat, you would you'd be happy to know that last time around, I had a lot of difficulty with the chess.com analysis board here and moving pieces around. And like a good chess player, you know, you'd expect good chess players to like do prep and to like actually spend some time like prepping things out so i'll be happy to let you guys know that i spent all of 27 seconds messing around with this so i'm basically a pro at using the chess.com analysis board now or the uh, classroom board but if i mess up like putting a piece out or something like that like i'm still learning because i did my prep but sometimes i don't know where i was going with this joke but uh <laughs> Loki. <laughs> maybe we'll have to edit that out in post actually no we'll leave it in anyway so let's talk about peace trading Chili, why is it important that we know how to trade pieces in chess? So it's important to know how to trade pieces because there is an aspect of chess which is beyond strategy, which is purely mathematical. Now, if you have five pawns and your opponent has no pawns and it's an end game, probably you're going to win the game. There's mm -hmm. a very, very, very high chance you're going to win the game. And so it's important to know that what determines the strength of your position is uh, is also influenced by the material count in some positions. Mm -hmm. Like, in some positions, of course, yeah, you could play a gambit and you'd be down a pawn, but you'd have a good position. And that's something we'll get into later on in the lesson. But mm -hmm. it's important to keep track of your material count, right? And mm -hmm. each piece has a different value. And so, for example, a knight is worth three points of material. Mm -hmm. and a queen is worth nine so you obviously don't want to trade a queen for a knight yeah so where do those piece values come from chili uh, i'm not really sure to be honest with you i think okay. someone just arbitrarily invented it but the way that it's set today it's pretty pretty um i'd say it's very accurate in my yeah opinion. absolutely I can I can elaborate a little bit there too, and without going into too too much detail because I'm not so clear on all the details. But basically, it has to deal with the pieces' movement and capability and how much they control of the board. So the queen, being that she can go along the diagonals as well as up and down, left and right, uh, means that that wasn't right at all. So here, here, she just controls a lot of the board, and so naturally she is the most powerful piece, and so she has the highest point value. Where that nine points comes from, again, there's a mathematical reason for it, but basically the pieces or the piece values are just tied to like the scope of the piece and how much that they can do. So did Fisher, I think, did Bobby Fisher assign piece values? That'd be really cool if that is the case. I need to double check that. Um, but if that's true, love you, baby, then that's super sick. Anyhow. Piece values were invented before uh, Fisher's time, but he did make an adjustment to the piece values. He said that bishops are a bit, uh, are worth a bit more than knights. Yep. So both the bishops and knights are worth three points, but Fisher says that a bishop is worth either 3.25 or 3.5. Yeah, yeah. And the knight is three. And the reason for that is we'll talk about in a later lesson, but basically bishops, when you get towards the end of the game and the board starts to open up, the bishops can cover a lot more, so that's why they're worth just a little bit more. But also it depends on the position. If you're in a really close position, then knights can maneuver around a little bit easier and make that work. So... With that in mind, Chili kind of alluded it alluded to it earlier, but a big part of chess is learning how to trade pieces and trade pieces effectively. Again, you don't want to throw a queen out for a knight. So if a, a knight is attacking, you don't want to trade a queen for a knight. That would be bad. 
So, and here we go. Here's where it gets complicated. I, ah, wait, I know how to do this. There we go. Okay, so we reset, and then I'm going to unselect this to make sure that I don't just, like, paint the whole board with queens. So anyway, that would be a bad trade, or what we call a bro trade. So I'm going to introduce to you guys three types of trades in chess. There is a good trade. There is a eh trade. It's not good. It's not bad. It's kind of just eh. And then there's a bro trade. A bro trade is just like, bro, why did that happen? Like, who... Who is making the decisions around here? That's crazy. Why would you ever trade something like that? So with that in mind, the simplest way to evaluate a trade is just, are the pieces equal? So here, actually, this would be correct because white moves first. So let's pretend we do E4 and then E5. Remember that each piece has a letter and a number assigned to it. So when we're referencing this, that's what I'm talking about. So if I take this pawn, a pawn is worth a pawn. So one point for one point, that's a... That's an all right trade. I mean, it's not good because we're not winning material necessarily, but it's not bad because we're not losing material either. It's kind of eh. And then when the queen comes out, this is what we call the Scandinavian defense. Then there's this piece. The queen is super duper important. And so naturally you want to defend that. And we bring this knight out and start attacking it. And so naturally we don't want to trade a queen for a knight. So this would be a bra trade. We <laughs> This would very much be a bra trade. Typically, if a queen is not trading herself for another queen or some sort of huge tactical advantage like a sacrifice, then it's a bro trade. So just to reiterate, good trades, bad trades, and bro trades. So, so you don't trade your queen unless it's like a checkmate. Uh -huh. So if Absolutely. you have a position where you can sacrifice the queen to checkmate, then by all means go ahead. But if not, then you should probably hold on to the lady. Absolutely. The lady is... We got to protect our queen because we respect the women out here at the Mad Lad Chess Academy. Anyway, so with that in mind, let's talk a little bit about what was my next point that I was going to make. So we talked a little bit about peace trading, good trade, bad trades, and bro trades. Now, with that in mind, we can talk a little bit about hmm, where do I want to go with this? As you can see, we totally prepped this out at the time. Let, <laughs> let's talk a little bit about that G word that the uh, that Chile was talking about a little bit earlier. So in a position like this, the Queen's Gambit, you've heard the G, this isn't the Queen's Gambit, but what am I talking about? Chile's the Queen's Gambit player here. So Chile, take us through the Queen's Gambit. It's D4. Okay. Yeah. It's D4. Mm -hmm. D5 is D5. the main line. Mm -hmm. C4, C4. And E6 defending the pawn. E6 defending the pawn. Okay. So, so this would be the Queen's Gambit. This is now, the Queen's. Whether it's... Good. Yeah. And so whether it's closed or open, or declined or accepted, is based on what black does on the next move. So mm -hmm. let's say I play knight to f3, mm -hmm. and black takes the pawn. Oops. Oops, sorry. If black yeah. takes this pawn, then this is the accepted variation, because he accepted to take our pawn on c4. The pawn on c4 was hanging, and it's a good trade for us. Now, mm -hmm. this is very peculiar, because how is this a good trade if we're going down the pawn? It's a good trade because in the future, so let's say black plays knight to f6. Mm -hmm. Oop, what? Let's play knight disappears. No, here we go. Knight to f6. And then white plays e3. Mm -hmm. You can see on our next move, our next move is going to be to play bishop takes c4. So we're already threatening to capture back the pawn. And mm -hmm. what did we gain for that? Development. So we treat, we end up going equal because that pawn on c4 is really tough to defend. Mm -hmm. And so this is what we would call a, a positional gambit where we're sacrificing a pawn to get a better position in the game. Okay. Now, there are other types of gambits, like in the scotch gambit, we're playing to go for checkmate. Yep. And so, so that's way more tactical kind of... and trappy. Yeah. yeah. So that's kind of the rundown, and that's talking a little bit about Gambit. So the G word of the day is Gambit. And what a Gambit is, is basically where you give up a piece, usually a pawn, for a better positional sort of composition on the board. And what positional purely means is just that your pieces are arranged in such a way that you have a little bit more space, you have a little bit more to maneuver with. What's up, Buddha? Good to see you. So you have, you're giving up a piece, so you're behind on a piece, but you have something what we call compensation in the form of a better position. So you have a better positional. Sorry, positional advantage is lovely. Indeed it is. 
Uh, baby. So we like a little bit of positional advantage. So whenever you hear the term gambit, you've probably heard of the Queen's Gambit, either the show or, you know, just in passing and stuff like that. Whenever you hear that word gambit, it usually just means in chess that you're sacrificing a piece, usually a pawn or some other thing to get a better position. So now that you know what a gambit is, let's go through a couple exercises to see what's a good trade and what's a bra trade. So let's pretend that we have... Let me just reset the board here real quick. And we'll bring, well, no, don't. Can I get rid of that? Okay, this is the part where it's tricky. I think you, do I just like, how do I, there we go. Okay, so we toss the piece the There we go. Oh, yeah, you got it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we were talking about the Scotch Gambit earlier, which is something that I play. The Scotch Gambit opens with e4, e5, knight to f3, knight to c6 in response. And then white plays to d4. So. Is this pawn trade a good trade, a bad trade, or a, a sorry, a bra trade or an ant trade? Maybe we can get something in the chat. What are we thinking? Give it like a second or two. Doo -doo -doo -doo. This is an opening that I love playing, by the way, and Chile has taught me in lessons. So this is like my main repertoire. So I really, really enjoy it. Uh, mm, it's a, it's an air trade, but okay positionally. Absolutely. So maybe I agree with you there. So we are gambiting upon knowing full well that we're going to get a positional advantage. And check this out. So we bring this bishop out. And so we're now, now behind a pawn, but this bishop is going to get really, really powerful really, really quickly. Let's say the bishop comes back out to c5. This is what we call a mainline scotch gambit. We'll talk about main lines and side lines a little bit later down the road. But we bring this bishop out. Now, check this out. We are going to push another pawn to c3, and then we're going to give that up as well. So is this a good trade, an ant trade, or a bra trade? We'll see what people are feeling. I think the answer will surprise you. So I'll let chat catch up here in a second, but this is actually a bra trade for black and I'll show you why. Because later down the road with how the Scotch Gambit works, I didn't see it. Oh, it's the uh, D takes C3. This is actually a bra trade for, for black and it's a very good trade for white. We want this to happen because check this out. Once the bishop comes over here to F7 with check, that means that the king has to basically take here so the king has lost his castling rights and then after we do that we bring our queen up to d5 and we put the king in check yet again and this gets really really nasty normally you come over here and remember we are now down a pawn or basically two pawns and a bishop but we're going to get it right back so we come over here with check. The king usually has to come over here. We can come over here and pick up the bishop. This is a tactic we'll talk about later down the road. And so we pick back up our bishop. And then eventually, once the king moves back, you have a couple different options. Some people like to take the pawn right here. This is a line, so we're equal again. But look at all the space that we have now as white. Look at all the positional sort of advantages that we have here. So sometimes... Yeah, yeah, but the fact that black can't even cast them anymore. Yeah. And it's important to note that there's a relative value, not just between, uh, let's say, a knight and a bishop, but between pawns themselves. And mm -hmm. so what this means is that as white in this position, we sacrifice the C pawn and the D pawn. So we have no C and D pawns. And mm -hmm. black traded off the E and F pawn. Yep. Now, like, like Drew and Lady said, uh, trading D for E is a little meh, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. But trading for F as black is really bad. That's a huge bruh. Yeah. <laughs> right. Because usually we're going to castle on the king side, right? In most of our games, we castle king side. 
And if yep. you look at the f7 square, it's completely exposed because there's no pawn defending. And so the queen can give many checks along the a2 to b8 to g8 diagonal. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be very tough for black to defend. Yeah. So in that way, you're, uh, we're talking a little bit about pawn position. So he was talking about centered pawns versus flank pawns, a C pawn and an E pawn. And E pawns a center pawn, a C pawn is a flank pawn. And so there's a lot, there's so much that we could talk about in that already. But in this case, white is just absolutely dunking. So don't think that just because you're trading piece for piece, value for value, that you're always going to come out on top. Sometimes your opponent is going to have a little bit of a, a follow-up or a counterplay that's going to allow them to pick up more material later down the road. Which brings us to our next illustration, or our next sort of topic, which is the idea of a capture chain. So let me reset the board here really quickly. By so the way, before we start, can I actually show a really cool line here? Yes. So the line is e4, mm -hmm. e5, e5. So it's a typical opening, and then we play d4 as as white, mm -hmm. already sacking a pawn yep. after e takes d. We could take with the queen, and then they'd play knight c6 point mm -hmm. of this is actually to play c3. Mm -hmm. So c3 is kind of similar to that Scotch Gambit idea. And then they take, of course. Mm -hmm. So now we've completely lost two full pawns. The idea in this position is, you guessed it, to sacrifice another pawn and play bishop to c4. Bishop to c4. Oh, this one, sorry. Bishop yeah. to c4. And then they are, they're obviously going to be very greedy and take the pawn. So mm -hmm. he takes b. Yep. And now bishop takes b2. Bishop takes which one? b2? Uh, dark square bishop takes b2, yeah. Very good. And now look at these monster bishops. Look at all yeah. the development we have. The queen is completely open to room free. The bishop mm -hmm. on c4 and b2 are lining up against the king perfectly. And so in this position, this is like an extreme example of where... Black is up two pawns, but it's probably close to losing. Agreed. So again, positional play, we want to reiterate. And remember that bishops, we talked about it last time, they're, they're runners. They like to run around. They're like the kinds of people that run 5Ks during the holidays for no particular reason. So when bishops have control of this huge diagonal right here, this is really, really solid. And we can really open up and have all sorts of crazy fun with this sort of position. So let's bring it back here as well. So the capture chain that we had there as well, so we can talk a little bit about a capture chain. A capture chain is basically just a sequence of captures that you calculate out. So in this particular instance, we are calculating, and calculating just means that you're thinking ahead. So in chess, you have to do a lot of thinking ahead. We call that calculation. And so in this capture chain, we have E takes D, C3 threatening the D pawn, D takes C, and then Bishop comes out, knowing that he's going to come over and take B2. He doesn't have to necessarily. That's something we'll talk about a little bit later down the road as well. You don't always have to take. So make sure that you're calculating, and I'm guilty of this myself. Sometimes I only calculate the capture line, but nobody says that you have to capture a piece necessarily in chess. So you always want to calculate for contingencies as well. But kind of going through all this, this is an example of kind of a calculation or a capture chain that you're thinking through. Another example that you'll see a lot is you'll have like, let me see if I can go back and reset the board set a position okay let's say that we have a knight here a knight here a pawn here and then a bishop let's say like right here and so we're thinking about everything is eyeing down this pawn right here so this knight is attacking this pawn as well as this bishop so when we're thinking about our next move as white this is white to play here you have to think about, you kind of want to go through it in your head about the, well, I mean, it would be, if it was white to move, it's simple to take the, the black bishop here. But let's say for the sake of argument, we don't want to take that. So in that way, we have to think about like, okay, if the knight takes here, then what can we take back with? Or if the bishop takes here, what can we take back with and stuff like that? So it's oftentimes the case, let me say, let's put another knight, like, oh, okay, this is a better example. So let's say this knight comes over here and takes this, and then we take back that, and then the bishop takes back. And you'll notice that we go behind a pawn here because a couple moves ago, we were here, here, 
and then we had a pawn right here and a knight right here. Actually, let me just do this and load this here. I'm get wait. There we go. Okay. So in this way, you have to consider that this pawn is hanging out right here. If black takes, ooh, er, is it going? Or to... even we could trade the 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 f5 bishop for a knight on c on f6, e, just to make what's, it. What's that? Practical. Trading the bishop for, I mean, setting the bishop back to c8. Yeah, to c8. Uh, the knight on, yeah, the knight on f6. I knight think on that will work. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, there we go. And so we have, I like a little position like this. So we're loading in. So this knight is taking right here. And so black makes a move. It's not letting me move for white here. Let's say, actually, we could do this example here. So this comes out and then black comes out right. Actually, we would want to come out about there. Actually, let's do that. So we can calculate here that if this knight takes, then this knight can take back. That would be an example of a capture chain as well. So it's not always that like you're calculating into the future based on, you know, throwing pieces out there. Sometimes it can be that all the pieces are going to land on the same square and you have to calculate out the the captures here. So knight takes pawn, knight takes knight, and then we're ahead by two points. That would be an example of a capture chain. So when you have a lot of pieces here that are piling up on one square, don't worry, just take the time, think about it, examine all of the pieces and consider their values. So a knight is worth three, and then a pawn is worth one, and then another knight is worth three. So if we were to trade this knight for this pawn, we would be plus one, or black would be plus one, but then if we take back with our knight, that's three points, we earn three points. So we would be plus two. So is that a good trade, a bad trade, or, or sorry, is that a good trade, a bra trade, or an ant trade for black? Oh, Love Baby also said that trading to double up your opponent's pawns is a good trade as well. Absolutely. Yeah, doubling pawns, we'll talk about that probably in a later lesson as well. I think that's a bit more advanced than we'll stick to the... the yeah, basic yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, doubling pawns is definitely a lesson worth talking about, but we'll get to it a little bit later down the road. I think chat's thinking on it. We've got some got some people probably that will say yes, some people will say bruh, some people will say meh. But this is actually a bruh trade. This is definitely a bruh trade for black. And as you can see, if you watch up here, you'll notice that there's super bruh. Yeah, baby said it's a super bruh trade. Not only is it a bruh trade, but it is a super bruh trade. So in this case, also the pawn can take and open up the queen and give us all sorts of maneuverability there. But you'll notice up here for black, it says plus one. So Chess.com will actually keep track of the point values that you have. If you're playing over the board, like in person, you have to kind of calculate for yourself, but online, it actually will show you. So right now, black is ahead by one point, but if we take back, look what happens. Now we're ahead by two. So absolutely, like Baby said, this is a very much a super bra trade for black. So that's just an example of and a capture just, chain. Uh, go ahead. Just to show you how far this can really go, this notion of math, the, math, the mathematical aspect of the chess. Mm -hmm. So, uh, let's say two grandmasters are playing. If one grandmaster goes down a pawn and they get into an end game, that is a hundred percent of victory. If it's not like a rook end game, and we have we don't get many specific cases like a like a typical uh, outside pawn. Like it's if it's an h pawn, then it's a draw. Like mm -hmm. okay, let's say we have king and pawn versus mm -hmm. king, but the king. I mean, the pawn is an h-pawn. In that case, it's a draw, but if it's not those extreme circumstances, then just being one pawn up is enough to win the whole game as a grandmaster. Yes. So it's really important that you maintain your material. Yep. There have been games that have been decided, like you said, literally on one pawn. And I used to be the kind of player in chess where it's like, okay, if I just trade down, then my opponent has less pieces to work with, and so I can do better. But that also means that I have less pieces to work with. And the more that you continue to climb in chess, the more that you're going to realize that you're going to need all your pieces to beat people because chess is not one of those games that you can just kind of like expect your opponent to not be able to, or you expect your opponent to trade down. Sometimes opponents don't like trading and sometimes opponents can do a lot more with the pieces that they have on the board than you originally thought. So I've had to rekindle some habits and not trade down everything, but Again, as long as you're thinking about trading and capture chains and point values and stuff like that, this gets really, really easy.
it's not that difficult. Um, it takes a little bit of practice, but once you get into it, once you get into the feel of it, you understand like how capture chains work and the point values, then you'll find yourself in a lot of really promising positions, especially if you're just starting out in chess, because a lot of beginners have a lot of trouble like calculating these things and calculating these chains and whatnot. But again, like you said, even if you are just one pawn ahead, sometimes that's enough to decide a chess game. It certainly is at the highest level, and most of the time it'll be the same for you as well. Welcome in, Barb King. Good to see you. I think it's important to talk about at this point what to do if you are up material because it's one mm -hmm. thing to say you should be up material and then people can kind of feel stuck and say okay what now and if you're up material so let's say that trade happens and mm -hmm. black takes the knight then let's say bishop to g4 happens mm -hmm. and we play h3 yep so we're playing h3 for a very specific reason. We'd love for black to take into us. We'd love for them to play bishop takes knight. Mm -hmm. And the reason this is, is because if you're up material, the way to play the game is basically, the name of the game is trading. Mm -hmm. so the trading floor is open. Trade, trade everything. Then you probably should. Yeah. This goes a bit further, and uh, at a more high level, you should probably avoid trading pawns and trade pieces. Yes. So pawns aren't really considered pieces. They're considered pawns, basically. And uh, so trade your pieces, which are your minor pieces and major pieces. So bishops, knights, rooks, queens. In sensibly, of course. Yeah. And you maintain as many pawns as possible. Yep. Simplification, so, as maybe put. Yeah. Oh, also, welcome, exactly. Barb. I recognize the name. It's been a while, though. I, I noticed you followed, or I double checked your profile in here, and you've been following for a little bit now. So it's good to see you back. I haven't been streaming in a while. So, but we are doing a free lesson with our good friend, Chili. He is my chess coach. And so, absolutely, I agree with you there, Chili, that especially if you're ahead of material. So, being ahead of material, like whenever I play over the board, there's like a, like an actual sigh. Like whenever I like come in front of a exchange or come out on top of an exchange on my head on material, I kind of sigh. And the reason for that is that like usually as long as you're ahead of material, as long as you don't blunder anything, most of the time you're probably going to win. So, there's kind of this visible sigh or this like relief that comes with being ahead because you know or you can rest on that as long as you just trade down pieces. Again, pawns, not so much, but as long as you're trading down pieces like rooks and knights and stuff like that, if you're ahead of material, you're going to probably win. So it's a good position to be in, being ahead of material, and um, feels good. And so we call that simplification. So there's debate about simplification and when you want to do it and that sort of thing, but generally for beginner players and those of you guys who are just getting started in chess, when you are ahead of material, if you simplify down and trade off pieces, then it's probably going to come out good for you. So, yeah. Do we have any questions from the chat so far? Or anything else you wanted to add, Chili, in the meantime? Uh, yeah, there's something that I'd like to add. Sure. I would like to add that it's very important that we understand how the queen should be traded off and when the queen should be traded off. Because mm -hmm. the queen is a very special piece. Yes. Now, we know that in chess, there's the opening, the middle game, and the end game. Mm-hmm. And usually the queens don't come off that early in the game. And so this is what we would call a typical, almost a middle game, because we're almost finishing developing. After we play, so let's play a few more moves. Let's say knight to c6, mm -hmm. bishop e2, mm -hmm. bishop e2, bishop e3 is fine. Yeah. E3, okay. Let's say g6 for black. E, g6 for black, or g6. Bishop e2. Bishop e2. Bishop g7. Bishop g7. And both sides castle. And both sides castle. Uh, that, not queen side. Let's cut. You want king side, right? Both are fine. Yeah. Okay. Uh, it's just so straight Yeah. Wait, let me delete this variant. Did we do a move? I think earlier. Yeah, maybe. So uh, this mm. is fine, though. So yeah, in this yeah. position, we've reached the middle game, right? So mm -hmm. we've developed all our pieces, and now we're starting to build a plan of attack. Yeah. And if we're up material, it's a good idea to queen trade. Yes. For the same idea that we are up material, we'd love to trade as much as possible. 
if we are down material doubt though, so let's say for some reason we lose our knights and one of our bishops. Mm -hmm. We keep down material, and so it's very important to not trade the queens off because mm -hmm. the queen is the most powerful piece on the board. If you trade that off, it's probably going to dry out the game a lot. Yeah. If you keep the queens on, it's still complicated, and it's what Baby said about simplification if you're up material. If you're down, you want to complicate things, so keep the queens on. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And there's, we'll probably talk about queen trading in its own, its own lesson. Uh, King G5, was there a King G5 move in here somewhere? <laughs> uh, or Knight G5. Knight to G5. Oh, Knight G5 our Knight to G5. Yeah, yeah, Knight to, I was calculating that's that too. Knight to G5 with this threatening. Yeah, that looks really sick. So, very good, very good eye, baby. Baby's thinking tactically and thinking about setups and stuff like that here. So, but absolutely, queen trades we'll probably review a couple of times because they are so pertinent in chess. You're going to do a lot of queen trading and evaluating what's a good trade versus what's a bad trade. That's something that I still struggle with as a player as well. So, absolutely. So to recap what we talked about today, we've talked a lot about trading. We talked about point values. There are three types of trades in chess. You have a good trade, an eh trade, and a bruh trade. And sometimes there's even super bruh trades. And so the goal of chess is to make as few bruh trades as you can and make as many good trades as you can. And the way that we do that is we evaluate the trades by doing capture chains or kind of calculating, seeing how the pieces can capture one another. And in some special cases, like in the case of the queen, we need to take a little bit of extra time to think about when it's a good idea to trade queens. Ideally, when you're up material, you can trade queens because that will simplify things and make things a little bit easier. But if you're down material, you want to keep your queens on the board because that complicates things. And we want to complicate things for our opponent because that means there's more likely a chance of them to mess up. So... If there are any questions from the chat, feel free to let me know. Also, Baby mentioned that I have my first over the board turn. Oh, I have, have or had. Because, Baby, if you want to, I can talk to you about how tournaments work and that sort of thing. I'm actually a tournament director at my club, and so I direct tournaments, and I see a lot of new players and stuff like that, and so I can give you kind of the rundown on how those work. Um, but if not, that's totally cool, too. But, yeah, let's give the chat a second to chime in and see if they have any questions. Sorry, I'm double. You may see me looking over a lot. I'm trying to make sure my 3D printer has been like on the fritz. It's been acting very erratically lately. So I'm always looking over to make sure that the print is still running. Um, but it looks like it's good for right now. Is that a what piece are you printing right now? Is that That's a knight. knight. Yeah, I, they put in an order for um, a good number of knights because we have a bunch of kids that are about to promote out of the knight class. Um, so they needed a bunch of them. And so I'm printing them off now. Um, so the highest one would be the queen there, right? Yeah. The yeah, the highest is the queen. There's one section above that which is like championship, which is you literally pair off with a GM or an IM and they like train you. Um, so nice. yeah, yeah, yeah. But beyond that, the queen class is taught by like David, who's a candidate master and he's one of the owners of the club. So yeah, there's very few kids in that class. Um, but yeah, a lot of pawn classes, a lot of I teach the pawn and the night courses at my club, and so I teach a lot of little kiddos and I'm teaching like the basics and stuff like that, and it's absolutely amazing. So with that, we'll wrap up today's or this lesson for at least video purposes. If you guys are watching on YouTube, we do these lessons every Friday over on twitch.tv slash ASRedrew. Come check us out. Chili and I hang out and we talk about chess and teach you guys how to play. So if you're interested in that, do stop by. I bought a 3D printer from wish.com for 20 bucks. Sheesh. I wonder how that's going. Anyhow, but uh, we'll wrap up this video. Thank you guys so, so much for hanging out. Leave a comment, like, comment, subscribe, all that stuff. Even if it's something as simple as like, I think Drew's glasses look funny, then that's pretty cool. So yeah, we'll wrap up. Any other thoughts, Chili? That's about it. Thank you everybody for watching. If you're watching this on YouTube and uh, yeah, stay tuned for more. Sick indeed. All right, we'll close it out.